All right, let's 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 jump right in. Um, so I think a great place to start is with the origination story. Um, let's talk about what airdrops actually are and um, how long they've been around. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's probably Bitcoin OGs here who can give a uh, better history on airdrops than I can. But I think it essentially started with Ethereum and the creation of Ethereum wallets where you had this token standard ERC-20 and it was very easy to just give someone something whether or not they knew they had it, right? Everyone had an Ethereum wallet and at some point people realized you could just give tokens to a specific Ethereum address whether or not that person wanted the tokens. And I think sort of the two main initial use cases for airdrops, right? Or I'll step back, right? An airdrop is just you are distributing tokens to someone. That could be in exchange for something non-monetary, taking an action, or it can just be I am giving you tokens, right? Um, and some of the first use cases were one sort of like trying to compete with existing platforms. So for example, Stellar, um, when they first launched, they gave some number of Lumen tokens to every Ethereum wallet address, right? They were trying to give people a stake in the Stellar network and, and have them switch over. And there's other examples of that, like with Ontology and Neo. Essentially the idea, right, is that you give people a stake in a network, some upside for switching over, and hopefully this drives adoption. Um, there were also a lot of sort of early use cases in the sort of whole frenzy of last year where, you know, you had a token, you wanted to uh, create some trading volume, you would either give it to people in the hope that they flip it, or potentially you would just give it to all wallets tied to a specific exchange, for example, right? And this is when, you know, a lot of tokens were really just focused on like pumps and sort of quick, uh, really wanted to see like quick increases in value. And, and that was sort of an early use case for, for airdrops. And um, how have they evolved since? Yeah, well, I think there's uh, right now a lot more focus on compliance, which Georgia is much more quali uh, qualified to talk to than I am. But I think really, you know, a lot of focus has shifted towards ideally, like a lot of the scammers have gotten out of the space. People want to drive community and adoption. I think there's more and more widespread understanding. And we were talking about this earlier that like no one uses any product in the space, right? You look at DAP Radar, maybe the top product in the space has like a thousand daily active users. That's nothing. Um, and companies have, you know, a lot of things they can do to drive user adoption, but one of the things they have that's really unique is tokens, right? You know, there's a lot of reasons why people are bullish on the space. You can give early users um, an incentive to get in early, and in theory, as the network value goes up, early users are rewarded. Um, and so I think their airdrops have evolved where people are now um, really just want to give tokens to people who are actually going to be involved in the community. That can be something as simple as we are going to give you $5 worth of tokens for joining our Telegram group. Or, you know, some platforms where their, their end users are developers, we want to give very targeted users, for example, open source developers, a fairly large number of tokens, $500, $600. And the idea is that this is, presumably, it's, it's seemingly doing a much better draw, uh, job at driving users towards these networks. Um, completely agree. Uh, I like the initial example of trying to create a price uptick temporarily yeah. and seeing how it plays out and crossing their fingers. It seems as the space has matured, so the strategies in distributing actual tokens, um, how do companies that you guys work with today uh, begin to approach or begin to think about their strategies around airdrops? Yeah, I think there's two parts. Like one is the compliance side, which uh, Georgia can certainly talk about. And the second is they generally come to us with some specific end goal, right? It's not just I am sitting on a reserve of 100 million tokens. I want people to have them, right? That, that's not really useful to anyone. But it's, you know, I have a platform for data scientists or I have a platform for smart contracts and I need developers to build on top of that, right? And so one of the like main tools they have in their tool shed for driving end user growth is... I have tokens, and I want to like have the users that I want on my platform staked in that network su network success. And so it's much it's much more like I have this end goal. These are the users I want. This is the behavior I want to drive. How can I structure airdrops and target users in such a way that like advances that goal? Right. It seems like there is a paradigm shift or a perspective shift where they start realizing you aren't sending tokens to just wallets or wallet addresses. You're sending them to actual humans, right? And who are those humans we're sending them to? And just on that note, from the compliance perspective, when you start looking at your strategy and thinking about who those people are that you want to drop to, um, that's really the key element of securities law because 
if we're deeming these tokens to be securities. It really matters less about where the company is or where the network is based or the founders, and it really matters where the people that you're dropping to are located. So that's really the situs of the jurisdiction. And to the extent you want to drop to US residents, then you have to comply with US securities laws. And so that's kind of the paradigm shift we're in as well, where people are starting to realize that it is something more. I think that's really insightful too, that it was that understanding that we're not dropping to these inanimate wallets, we're actually dropping to people, and that really changed things. Um, that's a perfect segue uh, into my next question, which is what are the top challenges that a lot of these teams face when they're trying to execute on an airdrop strategy? Yeah, I think the initial one is like identifying who their end users are and um, actually getting them involved. So, you know, we've talked a lot of projects and like you can have 50,000 users in your Telegram group. Like how many of those people are bots? How many of them are actually going to take a specific action? How many of them are actually like the end users of the product you want? And the answer is like probably not that many. Um, and so I think there it's people like they may have like underestimated how challenging it is to actually market to their end users. I think the second is like actually distributing tokens in a thoughtful way. Compliance, you know, is obviously important in and of itself, but something we've found is like, this may sound silly, but airdrops, right, to some extent you're giving away free money. And what we've seen in many cases is like, people will do all sorts of crazy things to get free money, right? If you're just sending money to a bunch of wallet addresses, it's not that hard to like go on Mechanical Turk and have people create a thousand ETH wallets. And for what it's worth, there are stories about people getting very, very rich in the Stellar airdrop doing this, where they would just create a thousand wallets and pile up all these tokens. And if you actually are trying to drive end users and value for your network, that's not useful for anyone. Right. And so that's something where we found compliance, right? KYC AML, you can tie one wallet to one specific person, and you actually know who that person is. And so that's like a much more effective way to actually make sure that, you know, the users you want to get tokens are actually the ones getting them. Georgia, have you seen cases where people, uh, bad actors, are finding ways around KYC AML, and what does that look like? Absolutely, and I think just to you know, kind of dovetail onto what Regan was saying, we have had instances where the compliance overlay actually makes a business case for these people, and it helps with screening out fraud and screening out people that you don't want to be a part of your network and you don't want to, you know drop these tokens to. And so, you know, there's amazing things people can do. You can buy boxes of passports and just start setting up identities of people. You can, um, I mean, there, you can set up residences all over the world and, and, you know, infiltrate people's identities. One of the things that we've uh, done at Coinless to prevent things like this um, in our high risk scenarios, we actually require a selfie to be taken alongside your form of identification. That way we ensure it's the person holding that identification really is that person. And um, these are just some of the steps that we've, you know, undertaken. And, and frankly, we develop based on, you know, our learnings over the, our, our work in this industry. But um, I think that whereas we used to, it was a much uh, tougher argument to you know, get companies to want to do AML KYC when we show the positive externalities and how it can really hone and create, you know, this viable network. Um, it, it, you know, kind of makes the argument for it. No, that's great. Um, it seems as the, as the space matures, there seems to, you start baking in these mechanisms to filter out uh, bad actors. And I'm curious at this point, what are some teams or projects you've seen execute on airdrops well and what do they do differently? Yeah, I mean, I think there's um, a company called Numerai that's basically a crowdsourced uh, quantitative hedge fund, right? I don't know if anyone's familiar with Kaggle, but it's like a competition where data scientists compete. And they basically took that model and applied it to a, a crowdsourced quant hedge fund where you are a data scientist in Russia or somewhere where you maybe could not just like easily get a job at a quant fund. They would release data sets, people could compete on algorithms to predict outcomes, and they would run trading strategies based on that. Um, they eventually introduced their own native token, the Numerare, into that model. And the idea was that basically by making um, people stake tokens on their predictions, like how confident they were, this actually improved like the outcome a lot. Um, and there it's a really interesting example where their subset of end users is fairly small, right? How many qualified data scientists are there in the world? Maybe it's 10,000, maybe it's 50,000, but like it's probably not millions. Um, and they did a very targeted airdrop to 
uh, highly qualified Kaggle users to data scientists, uh, data science departments at top universities, and they gave a non-trivial number of tokens, I believe it was a couple hundred dollars, dollars worth, to um, the end users they wanted, and they actually ended up driving a lot of adoption of that um, platform. Handshake is another one, which is basically a decentralized DNS service where um, they really only wanted like open source developers to have their end token. And they actually did some really interesting things, for example, making developers um, do OAuth with their GitHub account to actually prove that they had made contributions to open source projects where they didn't necessarily require specific action from end users, but they made users go through some number of hoops to really validate that they were who they said they were. Um, and I think they're also, again, they were giving, I think, a couple of hundred to a couple of thousand dollars per user, but you have these projects that are putting a lot more emphasis on making sure that the people they actually want getting the tokens are the ones getting it. So when I hear that, I think, great, on one hand, we have more qualified end users on receiving the actual airdrops, but then on the other hand, how are actual projects balancing widespread distribution with more narrow qualifications? How are you able to actually distribute it in a way where it's affecting change, um, but also going to the end user you want to use the token? I mean, I think that goes to what your goal is, right? I mean, you can't have your cake and eat it too necessarily, but um, it really depends on how defined you want that network. And if you're going for a real quality network of people that have a certain skill set or are going to provide certain value to your network, that's one thing. If you really just need broad distribution to get you know, more people using and, and, and you know, participating in, in your network, then, then that's, that's the other side of the coin. Yeah, I think that's an area where we, we're focused on a lot of coinless, right? Like, fundamentally, at a mission level, we really believe in like the power of Web 3.0 and, and sort of the future of this technology. But there's very little infrastructure in this space, right? You are selling direct to consumer suitcases and you run a Facebook campaign. It is very easy to see the ROI on that, right? There are like a million pieces of software that work very well that do that. And none of that infrastructure exists in this space. And so at Coinless, with our airdrops product, a lot of what we've spent the past few months doing is working with teams and understanding, you know, what outcomes do you want to drive and how can we track that and like make it scalable for teams? And so I think as infrastructure in the space evolves and you know, as our product does as well, teams will be able to get a lot tighter on, on that. Got it. Um, do you guys have insight into the work projects do post airdrop and how they're driving more of that engagement or achieving their end goal? Uh, to be honest, I, it, it really depends. Um, We've spoken to like less teams that have actually done them than more teams that, that want to do them. But you know, I think I think the space has moved away a lot from like people just giving a couple of tokens to a bunch of users. And I think that's very hard to track, right? It requires you to actually know the um, identity of all of the wallets you gave tokens to. And I, I think it is moving towards something where it is much more easily trackable, right? We gave a thousand dollars to these five thousand developers. Are they still building product on our platform? Et cetera, et cetera. And I think teams are, are very like laser focused on that now, where we've spoken to teams, for example, that are smart contract platforms. And you know, they potentially not only want to target engineers or data scientists, but they actually want people to push a GitHub commit on their platform or write a smart contract. Something that's actually very like verifiable. Um, Georgia, I want to come back to a point you mentioned earlier that it actually depends on the participants and where they actually live. Um, regarding the compliance uh, measures that are put in place. Um, we know that, it's no surprise, compliance is a touchy issue, uh, especially as it relates to airdrops. Um, there are several high-profile projects like Definity that have had to exclude uh, U.S. citizens from participating because of the regulatory landscape. I'm curious, uh, is that the case for all projects trying to incorporate U.S. citizens? Is, it, uh, is there a way to actually do that, or are we going to continue uh, actually blocking a segment of the population? Yeah, hopefully not. So <laughs> we've got a solution there, but let's start with just a little history lesson. Um, so a lot of people just assume that if you're giving away tokens for free that, you know, what's the problem? No harm, no foul, we're giving you these things and, and no big deal. And the problem is the SEC. And in 1999, you know, because like, this isn't the first time people have had this idea, right? In 1999, during the, the dot-com phase, a lot of 
of companies wanted to give away their stock. They wanted to give it away for free to get people to join their network. You know, join AOL and you'll get five shares. And basically the SEC said that even though you're not getting any you know, cash consideration, you're getting something of value because they're joining your network, they're providing a service, they're giving you an email address, whatever it is, and that is deemed consideration. And so this actually is the sale of securities, which must either be registered with the SEC or rely on some exemption from registration. And so, unfortunately, at that time for these companies, and for those that were public, this wouldn't have even been um, an option. Uh, well, uh, were they, how were they distributing those securities, or those, uh, that equity? <laughs> yes, yeah, so, and that's the other funny part about it, right, because actually to get a share you know, of common stock of a company, it's not the easiest thing to do. You don't just get you know, like a token in your wallet. Um, you had to open a brokerage account and you know, get it set up in order to receive that stock, and, actually issuing like two shares of stock is a real pain in the ass for companies. So didn't, that <laughs> mechanically didn't really work anyway, so it's probably good the SEC shut the whole thing down. But um, the, you know, aside from the mechanics of it, there was, at that time, there wasn't you know, really a viable exemption to be able to allow companies to build a network in this way without having to you know, actually sell equity and go through a registration process. And, What's really unique and, and exciting about the time that, that we're working in is there is an exemption uh, called Reg CF that actually allows companies to offer and sell securities to unaccredited investors. So this is just like regular retail people, not millionaires. And the real um, burden of this registration requirement has always been that you can only raise a million dollars using it. But with airdrops, you're not trying to raise any money, so it doesn't matter. So you can drop to an unlimited number of people using this exemption in the US. Um, and so that's one of the things that you know, we're working uh, with at CoinList to be able to really try to seamlessly utilize this exemption to allow companies to access the US markets. Because you know, frankly, this is where a lot of potential users and community members are, and they shouldn't be you know, left out in the cold with these types of offerings. And then just going back to these foreign offerings, a lot of people kind of make this assumption that because they're offering this in foreign jurisdiction, they don't have to worry about the laws and, and they're free and clear, but other countries have laws too. <laughs> so you do need to be very careful about you know, the securities laws of those jurisdictions. And another thing that we're doing at CoinList is you know, a country by country analysis of you know, whether these tokens are deemed a security there. And if they are, what type of offerings and exemptions are available there? And how can we make sure that companies can distribute these tokens as broadly as they want to? Um, what, outside of the $1 million raising cap, what other regulatory requirements come with Reg CF? Yeah, so I mean, it's not nothing. You know, there, there is a burden here. You have to file a form with the SEC called the Form C. There are some nominal annual reporting requirements, um, really just for the first year following the offering. Um, you have to provide financial statements. Uh, most of these companies like, don't even have you know, financial statements, so you have to prepare something. Um, and then there'll be a diligence process, and you have to use a, a crowdfunding platform. But really, at the end of the day, and, and again, this is part of our product, we, we try to make this as smooth and painless as, as possible. And I think the comfort that is provided by doing this in a compliant way is well worth the, the nominal expense and time to actually comply. And I think I know where you're going with this, but, but just on that note, um, there, has, there has been a case of a company that was attempting to airdrop tokens to US uh, citizens that was uh, issued a cease and, disorder, uh, cease and desist order by the SEC. It was called Tomahawk Energy. And um, the founders were fined, they were barred from the industry, um, and they were not allowed to continue their token operations. So this is a real, like this isn't just lawyers, like cause lawyers do this a lot, but this isn't lawyers just like trying to scare you to get you to use their services. Like this, this really is an, a legitimate issue. Yeah, as you said there, I think like it fits sort of very similarly into what we've done with token sales. We're like, you know, there are such smart people in the space that are working on building protocols, these decentralized networks, and like compliance is just not their core competency, nor should it be. And like we want to, I think we have a really compelling product for token sales. We're like, we've abstracted away the complexity around compliance. And we want to do the same thing for, for airdrops. And yeah, we're really excited about it. 
Um, I was curious uh, what the actual, like, what are the gravest consequences that come with uh, being slapped with a fine or actually violating uh, these regulatory requirements? Yeah, so, and I just told you I wasn't going to scare you, didn't I? Okay. <laughs> um, so the, the real issues are that, you know, you'll get a cease and desist order. That means you can't continue doing what you're doing. You're probably going to get a fine, um, depending on, you know, the size of your company and how much money. It could be anywhere from, you know, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions. But it really will scale based on the size of your enterprise. But I think the real issue that people often forget is that you'll be barred from the industry. And what that means is if you ever want to found a company again and try to raise money in a legitimate financing using some form of exemption like a Reg D private placement, which you guys have probably heard of, you would be deemed a bad actor. What is, uh, if, for those that don't know, what is that? Yeah, so it's the way most uh, startups raise money. They usually raise money from accredited investors, institutions, VCs, in what's called a private placement, a Reg D offering. And if you are deemed a bad actor, which means you've had a cease and desist or some other form of, of SEC sanction, you're not allowed to raise money for your company using that method. So that means no VC money. That means, you know, you're really... Um, you're really in a, in a bad situation if you're an entrepreneur or want to be, you know, in basically in this world. Um, and certainly any, you know, if you ever were to want to be an executive of a public company or work in the securities industry, that would be, um, yeah. you know, impossible. Also, even practically, like, no exchange in the space is going to want to touch any token that has been, like, the subject of SEC action, right? Like, there's been a lot around um, unregistered token sales, and, like, we're just starting to see them on airdrops. And so I think as... Time goes on, it'll become a lot more obvious that like compliance here matters a lot. Definitely, and um, people seem to look to the U.S. as um, one of the, the countries like with one of the strictest uh, regulations. I'm curious, one, is that true uh, from a legal perspective? And then two, uh, what are regions or countries that are comparable? Yes, yeah, so that's absolutely true. And the reason behind that is um, historically the U.S. has, you know, frankly led um, the, the rest of the world in capital markets, and you know, until recently, if you look at our ICO market, um, but um, all other, a lot of other countries have really patterned their laws after the U.S. laws. So you can, you know, take comfort if you're complying with the U.S. laws, you're most likely complying with laws in other jurisdictions. Um, not, you know, necessarily, but I think that's a good rule of thumb. But other jurisdictions that have pretty much comparable laws are the ones that you probably imagine. So like the UK, Canada, Australia, um, Singapore actually has very, very similar securities laws. So, um, and, and again, those are also the countries where, you know, you have the big target investors. So it's important to make sure that you're, you're complying there. And then um, other things that, we look into, I mean, we look at ju all jurisdictions all over the world, but there are often, you know, countries that have like quirky rules like Israel and Japan have some very unique um, regulations. And uh, I think that's been one of the kind of fascinating things about the work I've done lately is really learning how we can kind of insert these tokens into the securities laws of these other countries. Um, we know that Malta is uh, trying to become this like blockchain haven or Bitcoin haven. And so I hear this and think, oh, OK, well, I'll just airdrop to citizens in Malta. Uh, why isn't that a practical solution? Um, because there are three of them. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, like it's what we you know, where we started before, which is um, the securities laws are based on the location of the investors or the recipients. And so just because you're incorporated in Malta doesn't mean you can now go and drop your tokens to US citizens. You still have to comply with US laws. So good on you. You may get some like tax benefits, but there's there's really no justification for then, you know, thinking you can go around the world and, and scoff their own securities laws. Yeah, I mean, I think it makes a lot more sense in the context of exchanges where you need banking relationships, like where you're domiciled matters a lot. But if you're issuing tokens that are supposed to be global, like, yeah, setting up, you know, in Malta or Gibraltar or whatever, it doesn't really solve any of these issues. Got it. Um, and uh, speaking of tax bonuses, I'm curious, uh, let's say uh, in the case of airdrops, uh, from a tax perspective, uh, how do most citizens approach it if you um, don't know that you were airdropped something um, or you are holding on to an airdrop? How, how do we think about uh, taxation in the event of an airdrop? Yeah, I mean, it's, this is a very tricky issue and frankly, um, 
from a legal perspective, like the tax issues around tokens and token-based securities is probably the most complex area, and that's why I think people don't talk about it, is because they don't, they're afraid of it, mostly. Um, but the issue is, look, I mean, if you don't even know you have a token, it's very hard to pay taxes on that. Um, the, when you have a realization moment, and you uh, know, and not in the tax sense, but actually in your brain, um, and understand that you have something of value, you do have to do an analysis, right? Like, I received something for value. Did I pay anything for that? What is my basis in it? Do I, what, what are the circumstances under which I received that? Did I receive it for performing services, like a job? So that would be income. Do I need to pay income tax on this? I mean, these are the things that people should be thinking about. Um, importantly, there are de minimis exemptions in the tax code. So if it's really like not that much, you're not dropped more than like $1,000, you're probably safe. I'm not giving you tax advice right now, by the way. I'm just giving you rules of thumb. Uh, consult your own legal tax advisors. But um, you know, so if it's something de minimis, you can. You're probably okay. But when you start getting in, you know, to thousands of dollars, um, you know, you definitely need to consult with with your tax advisor. Um, and uh, when when companies come to you guys uh, asking about airdrops. Um, Outside of compliance, what are some unknown unknowns that uh, you think a lot of people aren't aware of or that would be an obvious uh, to someone who hasn't participated in an airdrop or um, executed on one? Uh, <laughs> I'm, looking, I'm looking at you. I have something, but I want to see where you go. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think at a high level, the space is moving from a model that maybe looked like I'm going to give you know one or two dollars to a bunch of people and like that'll drive community. I can't say definitively, but like it seems likely to me that that is unlikely to drive long-term community, right? For most people that have like the necessary electronics to receive two dollars worth of tokens, is that enough money for them to really give them a stake in, in a community? I, I would say probably not, but who knows? Um, and so I think it's moving a lot more towards I want some specific type of people in my community. Maybe it's based on like where they are. Maybe it's based on their interests. What type of software they're developing. And I think now it's people are realizing that like you need to give people more than two dollars to like drive that action, right? right? Or people stake in your network. And so I think something we think a lot about Coinless when we talk to token issuers and they want to drive a specific action, for example, having de developers write smart contracts on their platform, it's like getting out of this mindset that like two dollars is not going to drive an engineer to like work on your platform, right? It has to be more money, and ideally it's like tied to like more engagement and like actually validating certain actions. And so I think it's just like the biggest unknown unknown is sort of like what this model is going to evolve to, what's sort of going to become like the benchmarks for like how many token, how, you know, the dollar value of tokens end users are getting, how you actually validate that. And like we're sort of still in this transition moment. Yeah, so you kind of stole my answer, but I would just say that that move from quantity to quality, I think that's the biggest, you know, like people come in with a preconceived idea of like we just want to reach as many people as possible and then it turns out like you don't really like most of those people so you don't want them um, and then kind of in that vein I would just say um, learn like learning that it's so easy to get like some people to jump through hoops and do so many steps like the scammers and the fraudsters will kind of do almost anything in order to get tokens, but then how hard it is to get like legitimate users who will really add value to your network to just click through three screens, man. Just like, it's okay, <laughs> like put it, like just stay with me to get free things. It's actually harder than you think a lot of times. And operates as a good uh, filtering mechanism. Um, you guys had mentioned Stellar before, um, and I know that they've done uh, multiple airdrops. Uh, curious what you think about the effectiveness of doing multiple rounds of airdrops versus uh, what are different strategies you guys have seen? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, think, I think the model, I think if on one end of the spectrum you have, I'm going to give a million people $1 for opening an email, right? Maybe the other side of that spectrum is something like what 0x is doing with developer grants where i'm going to give you know 15 teams $150,000 or so, some fairly large amount um, and i think there's like obviously there's a, a bunch of things in the middle but you know at a high level something like developer grants right it's not like you just give a couple and like your products done right these are presumably gone go uh, on an ongoing basis where 
as a product evolves, there's different needs and there's different things you want to put bounties on. And so I think they're like that method where, you know, it's tied more closely to taking actions in a network, right? It's not like that stops once you've signed up or joined a Telegram group. And so I think there that method is, or airdrops are driving more towards that. And especially if you think about airdrops like end user acquisition, right? There's a massive, massive industry of like retention marketing, right? Most people who use a product don't use it again. And I would guess that like most projects in crypto have even worse retention than like most normal software companies. And so I think there it's not as simple as like we're gonna bribe people to like keep using our app each day, but like I, I would guess that projects will get much more thoughtful around how you can incentivize users to like have sustained uh, engagement over time. And that probably is sort of more in line with what you're talking about, about like multiple airdrops or at least this treasury that is continually distributing tokens to like end users of the network. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, I think it's really, really project specific and it's going to be based on like the needs of that particular project. And I also see um, more event driven airdrops, um, you know, in the future, which I think is pretty exciting when you can kind of combine the physical world and, you know, yeah, tugging on that thread, um, there seems to be one half a uh, school of thought that thinks uh, having surprise airdrops is the way to go, and then there's another school of thought where uh, you actually make the run up to it uh, uh, more public and more explicit. Do you guys um, have an opinion um, either way on the better tactic? Is there a reason why some teams opt to do them more stealthily versus um, versus not? I'm guessing the more stealthily is again just back to using that as like a calling mechanism so you don't just get the the hordes. But um, I really, I mean, there's obviously like pluses and minuses to, to both sides. I mean, if you wanna have like some exclusive luxury airdrop, like, you know, keep it from the world and, and surprise everyone. But you know, if you really want some mass appeal, you need to beat on some doors. Yeah, I think the, the thing that's hard is like, um, there's still not really like an established identity layer in crypto, right? So for example, like I can't send everyone in like my Ether wallet a push notification that like you've received tokens because those wallets aren't necessarily tied to identity. And so I think there, once you get closer to that, which I think like some platforms are getting towards, that's actually really interesting, right? It's like you have a push notification that, you know, there is like $100 in your Abra wallet or some mobile wallet from like a token issuer. That's actually like pretty cool, and I think you could do interesting things there. But like, I think you kind of need that identity layer where like you could tie a, a, your wallet to like your email or like your you know iOS ID. That that sort of needs to be figured out before those are that effective. Yeah, usability um, it seems to be the theme of the <laughs> theme of the night, um, both in um, actually using the products, but then also in how you're uh, receiving alerts and how you go about airdrops. So. Um, is there's like one piece of advice and one line you would uh, give uh, projects that are about to execute on airdrop strategy, what would it be? One main takeaway. I would just say like, do it right the first time. <laughs> like really do your homework, take your time and, and do it right the first time because you really don't get a second chance. Yeah, I would say like talk to people who've like done marketing before. I think this sounds so silly and marketing has become like the dirty, this dirty word in the industry, right? But like presumably with airdrops, you are trying to get users to do something. That's kind of the same thing as like marketing. And uh, I think like most, there just like has not been nearly enough focus around like, are we properly incentivizing users to take the end actions we want? And so I think it's really just like thinking about what are your goals with an airdrop and how can you structure it best to like actually achieve them? Right, and I actually think to that point, um, we see the transition going from marketing to community, right? Marketing was probably airdrops 1.0 where we had a snapshot of the blockchain and it just goes out to, you spray and pray and hope it come, goes to whoever. But I think as um, it's developed, uh, we see m smarter marketing, but then also seeing how end users engage with it and trying to build a community around the actual tokens. And I think that transition is what, what needs to happen. Um, so in the last few minutes, um, we'd like to open it up to the audience to ask questions. Um, anything from a legal perspective, from an operational perspective, uh, what are the questions you guys have? So 
So the question is, if you are trying to, so this fine gentleman is actually building the identity layer um, on Stellar that we kind of hinted at um, earlier in our discussion. And the question is, what are the regulatory issues? If you're just a tech service, basically, that you're building for other issuers and other users, what are the things you need to think about um, for those issuers? It's really kind of an agency role. Like, you're not having to comply, but you need to assist them with their compliance. And so it's it's all of the it's it's all of the basics right it's aml kyc you know making sure these people are who they say they are and then making sure that you've done an analysis as to what are we actually delivering is this token a security is it a utility is it a whatever whatever make that determination and then do we have if we've determined it's a security make sure they have the proper exemption to issue it and so if you're then you need to know the exemptions, right? So are we issuing this under Reg C? Are we doing Reg D? Are we doing 506C? If you do 506C, then you have to determine if those people using your identity are accredited investors. So now you have to start looking at bank statements and potentially income statements. And so those are the kind of things, this is a very long conversation, isn't it? We'll have to talk later. <laughs> but like those are the kind of things that you're gonna have to bake into that layer to help ensure compliance for those issuers. It depends on what service you want to provide, right? If you want to be full service and you want to provide you know, that full suite of products so that they can rely on compliance, that's what you need to do. If you just want to be the pure tech layer, you can do yourself and then give them a number of a lawyer. In the back. So great question. Not necessarily airdrop specific, but great question nonetheless. Um, if you can you repeat the question? I'm repeating oh, it. Awesome. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'm winding up here, people. I'm winding up. So On it. Um, if you are an investor in a what you think at the time and the issuer has told you at the time is a utility token, which later is deemed a security token, do you as an investor have any liability? And the answer is no. You are safe. The things you need to think about are tax consequences because now it's a security. It's actually maybe a better consequence for you because now you, you know, it's a capital investment. So maybe you can do something with that. I don't know what your tax returns look like. <laughs> but um, the rights that you have actually are that you have a rescission right. So you have the right to go back to that issuer and get your money back. And so you can think about if that's something you want to do or not. Okay, sorry, um, thresholds at the user level, meaning? Um, you mentioned an exemption of $1,000 around it. Oh, for tax purposes? Yeah. Is, there, is there sort of an aggregate level as well at a, at a per individual level? So the thing, oh, sorry. So we're talking now about airdrops and aggregate levels for tax purposes and if there's like a de minimis issuance threshold. So the thing about airdrops is if they're deemed securities, it's the company issuing its securities. So that's not a taxable event for a company. It's a taxable event for a recipient because they're issuing their securities. So, um, yeah, it's it's the other party that's, that's responsible, which is why it's kind of more nerve-wracking. You had a question? Um, yeah, so tying into what y'all were saying about usability, I'm looking at building airdrop models for, like, actually like motivating user testing of the product. So, um, you know, kind of between a bounty and Yes, so this is a very good question, and it's about um, when you're thinking about the type of airdrop you're doing and what the uh, actions are needed in order to receive the airdrop, whether it's taking like conducting like a bounty where you're actually performing tasks or a more typical airdrop where you're just like giving it to people for any old reason. Um, and actually the issue there is less about why you're giving it to them, and it's really more about what you're giving them. 
So if what you're giving them is deemed as security, then it doesn't matter what their form of consideration is. So it could just be them giving you their email address or their wallet address, that could be deemed enough consideration, or it could be them performing a function, like debugging your stuff or whatever other functions they're providing in this bounty. Um, it doesn't really matter. It's that it's a security, they're providing you with some consideration for it, and you need to find an exemption or registration. If you wanted to, to bounty only Malta citizens, that is more likely to be acceptable and not require any, you know, I can't, like, obviously there's a lot of things here, but yeah, I mean, Malta's very lax about what you can do, and so if one of, exactly, so if one of the three people there can fix your system, like, go for it. Yeah, so the question here is about Reg C, um, or Reg CF, and the um, maximum uh, amount raised cap, uh, which is 1.07 uh, 1 million currently. Um, there are now two bills uh, in the House right now to raise that cap, one to 5 million and one to 10 million, I believe. So yeah, there are, a lot of people are working hard to try to get that cap raised. Um, Right now, with the current political winds, I don't know if anything's going to get through the Senate, so I'm not like super like positive about it. But I know there's a lot of you know momentum, and, and people are definitely trying to do that. It's something that will have to be done um, from a congressional level. It's not something that the SEC has the authority to do. And um, but you know, not necessarily as relevant for airdrops because we're not raising necessarily money here. So I, I would say there. I think something that we're when we started CoinList, right? Like there were. A, a lot of companies wanted to do public offerings, and still a lot of high quality ones do, but I think there's now the realization that like, at least compliantly, you probably cannot raise money from like 25,000 investors, right? That's really hard. And I think what we're seeing is a sort of separation from like, maybe you can't actually engage your whole community in a fundraise, but there are still ways to like engage them. And I think there what we see is really interesting is companies, maybe you're just going and doing private sales from 50 investors, whatever, but Reg CF and the mechanism Georgia described actually lets you engage a very wide community, right? Because a million dollars is not that much money for most companies, but if you're not charging for the tokens, really, you can have like many, many investors in a Reg CF offering. And so it's sort of companies like doing fundraising and engaging community in parallel, but like realizing that it's actually potentially not the same groups of people, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah these would be done like, they're called side-by-side -side offerings. Yeah. So you can do an actual capital raise where you're bringing money into the company to actually build the network and utilize it. And then you can do a side-by-side -side Reg CF offering where you're growing your network and rewarding, you know, those participants. So do you know what the determinant is? Like what a cap is or whatever, 10 million, like five or five or 10 million, what determines like these caps? Why, why are the caps seem relatively low compared to some of the raises that these tokens are doing elsewhere? Uh, so the question is, why are the caps, like the Reg CF cap, well, not, lower? It's not in terms of what's being pushed through uh, regulation. You mentioned that there's two bills. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, yes, exactly. So why are the caps for Reg CF lower than other types of fundraising? And it's because you're targeting retail investors. And the SCC basically, is, a, and Congress, is of the purview that if you are a retail investor, you need to be protected from yourself. And you can only, because it's not only that the company can only raise so much, each investor can only invest a certain amount as well. And so it's really to protect people from themselves and not let them invest in these risky, you know, what are deemed very risky asset classes and, you know, not go bankrupt. Although, don't forget, you can go to Vegas and, you know, bet your life away and nobody's going to stop you. But God forbid you invest more than $2,000 in a startup. Absolutely. 
you guys like what Europe does in terms of the hydro checkbox that you go through a check in terms of being a higher credit investor to participate in investing? I, I mean, I've been preaching that to the SEC for year, like at least six years now, and mostly they say we don't care. But, um, but yeah, no, I, I love that. I mean, I'm. I think there actually is a bill, or some Congress senator, or someone has like proposed something like this. But who knows? Alrighty. Thank you guys so much, George and Regan. Yeah, We're a very thoughtful moderate. panel. Yeah. Really appreciate it.